In this episode, we'll be talking about why the most valuable services are actually a struggle for customers. We'll talk about how to design services that are easy and difficult at the same time. And finally, why human-centered design isn't always the best approach for service design. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. This is Yutaka Yamauchi. This is Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to design services that have a positive impact on people and that are good for business. My guest in this episode has studied service design by looking at sushi restaurants. He's currently a professor at the Kyoto University. His name is Yutaka Yamuchi. In this episode, we're going to address one of the big misconceptions in the service design field. And that is that we should design services to be as user-friendly as possible. Yutaka has a different perspective on this, and that is that great services are sometimes a struggle for customers. That's what we're going to talk about in this episode. We post new videos on the channel every week that help you to level up your service design skills. So if you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe and don't forget to click that bell icon so you'll be notified when new videos are out. I also have a free training on how to explain service design without confusing people. If you're interested in that, check the show notes down below for the link. So that's all for the introduction. And now let's quickly jump into the interview with Yutaka. Welcome to the show, Yutaka. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm really happy to have you on as the first guest from uh, Japan. So I'm really curious to your perspective on service design and the things that are on your mind. But before we start digging into your topics, for the people who don't know who you are, could you briefly tell us a little bit more about yourself? Okay, I'm a, I'm an academic and I study services. And uh, I'm in management field. Hmm. So I study services in uh, management from the management perspective. But then I got involved in design school. Uh, we have a design school in our school. So uh, I started thinking about connecting service and design. Then service design became very popular. And which school so, is that? Uh, where, where do you teach? It's a uh, Kyoto University. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So uh, since then, I've been doing, uh, I've been teaching and doing research on service design. All right. So th th that brings me to my next question. And that's the question I ask all of the guests. What is your first memory of service design? Okay, good. Uh, good question. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so when we started design school, that was uh, eight years ago. So I was wondering what I should teach. And then um, around that time, I started to hear the word service design um, from many people. So I didn't know what that was. Mm. But then I it made sense to me because I was doing research and service and then I was going into design, so service design. So that's that's how I got uh, connected in that, okay. in that field. Okay, cool. Yeah. So you've sent me three questions, really interesting topics uh, that haven't been really on the show uh, so far. I've sent you a few question starters. We're going to co-create the uh, this episode. Are you ready to start? Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's go. So the first topic, let me get it over here. The first topic is, it's already a really quick cryptic one. It's called intersubjective struggles. Do you have a question starter that goes along with this one? And can you show it to us? Yeah, that's why. Okay. Why? Yes, my question would be, why are some of the services intimidating? intimidating okay. for customers hmm. are, are services intimidating for customers yes um so for example if you go to an upscale restaurant mm -hmm. um in, in in japan we have sushi bars or some kind of traditional japanese restaurants but in europe you have french restaurants michelin star restaurants all those th uh, settings um you're kind of in intimidated yeah yeah when you, yeah, when you go to that kind of place, you worry about 
how you look uh -huh. and what uh -huh. kind of manners you have to master and all those things, right? Yeah. So yeah. and then yeah. when, yeah. So and then when you like uh, get into the setting and you start, let's say you order wine, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you are given this thick list of wine, and then you have to say something sophisticated. You want right? to sound smart, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So that kind of thing. But uh, the problem for me was this why question, right? Because existing theories of service um, basically suggest that uh, the customers should be uh, satisfied or pleased. Yeah. You have yeah. to please customers, yeah. right? And the customer satisfaction is very important. But then, so these theories, existing theories cannot explain why some, some of these services are intimidating. And especially the so upscale services, right? The exclusive premium service where you feel intimidated as a customer actually buying from someone. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's actually more marked in the, the uh -huh. kind of expensive settings. Yeah. But then actually my, my argument is that uh, every service, no matter how, ex how reasonable mm -hmm. it is or how expensive that is, is a kind of intersubjective struggle. Okay. It's a kind of mm -hmm. uh, intimidating. Yeah. And, oh, that's really interesting. Uh, what, what, where does this come from? Okay, so I, when I started doing research on sushi, um, or maybe I should get back. When I get into the field of service, I was thinking what to study. So I basically chose uh, sushi bars mm -hmm. in Tokyo mm -hmm. as, as a site. Um, so uh, the reason was that uh, sushi chefs are kind of uh, uh, intimidating. Mm, so mm. they have a stern look uh, on their face and uh, they don't smile, they don't try to please you. Mm. And on top of that, uh, when you go to a sushi bar like that, there's no written menu, mm. right? And there's no price tags. Mm. And you, you just order things and you eat. And after two hours, you're done. And then you ask for the check. And then you know the price. price. <laughs> so and then you have to pay pay for that, yeah. So um, so I I kind of found it uh, interesting. Um, again, the why question. Yeah. So I went into sushi bars and I started studying these sushi bars. So I basically uh, videotaped interactions mm -hmm. between sushi chefs and mm -hmm. customers, and analyzed these interactions in detail. So that's. Yeah. And, and and so it, it I, I didn't realize this before you actually before I started digging into your research and uh, now I see it all around me but it still what's your explanation why uh, it, it it's contraintuitive that services sort of feel intimidating or that you as a customer feel intimidated it why why is this uh, paradox there yeah. So um, my answer is this, uh, in any kind of service, there's this paradox. If you try to satisfy customers, customers will not be satisfied. So, so that's the paradox. My explanation is this. So if service provider tries to satisfy this customer, um, then the relationship a little bit changes. Mm -hmm. So now, this service provider tries to satisfy this customer and the customer thinks that, oh, this service provider is interested in my evaluation of the service. So the, the status it changes a little bit. So the uh, service provider becomes a little bit subservient mm -hmm, to, the, mm -hmm. to, the, uh, to the customer. Then the service from somebody subservient is not as valuable anymore. So that's the paradox. Mm -hmm. So, the, the, so that, that, the customer is king, right? That that's saying that's actually bad for your perception of the service that you are, that you're getting. Right. Is that is that the case? So, uh, yeah. Um, so so that's why many of the service providers try to make it uh, more difficult for customers. Hmm. Right. They, they, that's their gesture. Right. I, we, I'm not interested in satisfying satisfying you right i'm i'm just developing this sophisticated service hmm. you just came um you know that kind of thing right and, and what makes the, sense yeah, yeah I, I guess it makes sense but what does this uh, mean for us as a service design community 
how how do we incorporate this in our design process yeah so that's a difficult part so now um so service design in service design which is based on human center design mm -hmm. yeah IT, exactly yeah so you have to kind of empower users you have to you, you cannot intimidate customers right? <laughs> so that that's not that would be interesting <laughs> yeah <laughs> right but then service is interesting precisely because of this intersubjective struggle right so if you try to make so uh, if you try to make it easy then the customers just kind of feel the service as some kind of uh, quotidian like everyday kind of mm. thing mm -hmm. it's not it's not valuable mm. right and then if service de uh, designers try to design a service that's sophisticated and uh, non-quotidian and valuable then the customers have customers have to face that service yeah right yeah uh, they have to show that they they are qualified for that service right so mm -hmm. that's the struggle again mm -hmm. Maybe uh, a lot of questions regarding this topic, but maybe uh, you'll explain a bit more in the next topic. Uh, shall we move on to the second one? Because I think it relates to what you're saying, right? Right. And yeah. uh, my print and mail function, so I had to improvise. In <laughs> and the second topic is, um, is easy and difficult. And do you have a question starter again that goes along with this one? Uh. Okay, that would be... Who are? And what's so the question? Who are yeah. The, yeah, the question is, who are these customers that you try to satisfy? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So we kind of uh, think of customers as input to the service, hmm. right? Here's the customer uh, who has certain needs or requirements. And then here's the service that tries to uh, meet the requirements or satisfy this customer then the customer becomes happy and, and so on, right? But then I kind of uh, uh, I think this who is an important question mm. uh, in service. So um, I guess it's not making sense. Yeah, it is, but who, yeah, go on. I'm, I'm really interested, I'm okay. listening carefully, yeah. <laughs> okay, Here, here's my explanation. It's a little complicated, okay? I begin with this notion that service is value co-creation, okay? Mm -hmm. So yeah. customers customers participate in the service to basically work together with service providers and everybody else to co-create the value, mm -hmm. right? Okay, then here's the customer and here's the service. And then customer is kind of evaluating the value of this service, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. In the, old, in the traditional perspective, that makes sense. Okay, you just make it uh, easy, interesting, beautiful, uh, delicious. Mm -hmm. Then the customer becomes satisfied, or happy, and all that, right? But then think about this: this service is co-created with this customer. Mm -hmm. So now this customer is actually implicated in this service. He's part of so the now service. He's not consuming it. He's part of the service. Right. Yeah. So now the customer is basically uh, judging the value of this service, but the customer is also implicated in the service. Yeah. So now the customer's value is also part of it. Okay, right? yeah. The, the value of service includes the value of the customer, mm -hmm. right? Because the customer is implicated in it. So then the value of the customer, meaning who the, who the customer is as a person becomes important. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's why. Yeah. That's why in a in a high end uh, Western case, right? You have to prove that you're qualified. You have to show that you know the manners, you know the jargons, and you know how to behave, and all those things, right? Yeah, so you are implicated. Yeah. yeah. So so this the the, the 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 I don't I don't know if the word is <laughs> advanced, but the more uh, yeah, let, let's go skilled. The more skilled you are at using a certain service, um, the more value you bring as a customer to the service offering, the more value you'll be able to get out of it. it is that basically the concept? Yeah, that, that's how value co-creation works, yeah. right? So 
your your knowledge matters, right? Yeah. Your knowledge, your knowledge and experience, competence, exactly. everything matters yeah. for the value of the service. But also, uh, you are also part of the service. Mm-hmm. So your value, you know, what kind of value you have, what kind of value you represent matters. So what kind of person you are matters. Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, yeah. So it's not like just getting a better service by bringing in more knowledge. You, you know who you are matters right in the service and and uh once again the question this is of course a super interesting topic as we are human centered and we think about uh, who the customer is but we always think about how do we serve uh that type of customer right that's the at least that's the thinking i've been seeing in service design how do we serve the different customer types but not per se what do the c- different customer types bring in into the service that's like the other way around and, and so I, I come back to the question, what does this mean for the design process? Yeah, exactly. So, um, so again, the customers are not input to the service. Customers are actually output of the service. So the customer becomes certain person. That process is the service. Okay. In the case of sushi bar, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. you're intimidated. And the first question they ask is kind of testing you. Uh-huh, right? uh-huh. So w- whether or not you're qualified yeah. and, and so on, right? And you are tested, you are negated and tested, and you try to prove yourself. So now the service is the process by which you become a certain person, right? Mm-hmm. So um, my definition of service is like that. So if you design service, you have to design this process who the customers are and who they become that that's and that's yeah. tricky what's tricky about it what do you find yeah, hard so yeah. yes so when you start thinking about who they become you kind of negate the customers right so you are kind of challenging the customers mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right you you are mm-hmm. basically saying my service is sophisticated are you qualified right and then customers have to struggle to prove themselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that means that means you have to make the service more difficult for customers, right? Not easier, more difficult for Be- the Because if you are making it more difficult, it will allow them to get more value out of it eventually. Uh, and also, if it's easy, customers just see it as just ordinary service, mm, right? Mm, mm. So you just uh, let, let me give you one example. Yeah, right? sure. So yeah, please. Starbucks, Starbucks, or any kind of coffee shops like that. Um, they have like a, in the American Starbucks, Starbucks in the U.S. They have like a short, tall. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then grande, venti, mm-hmm. and enorme. On the, those are Italian words. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. So the Americans, most American customers don't know these Italian words, right? So the question is, why do they use that, that kind of obscure language yeah, in describing yeah, yeah. the service, right? So they have to make it uh, more difficult for customers, something that customers don't know, hmm. something something special for the customers. And, and this is so counterintuitive, right? We in the design pro in the design field, we think we need to make everything as user friendly as possible, as as uh, usable as possible, as without using jargon, without uh, uh, throwing in barriers, uh, lowering sort of the the effort somebody has to put into something. Um, but and and I guess that's okay. But as long as you realize that it has consequences for the value perception of the service your customer is sort of uh, getting, right? Yeah. But uh, I think I don't want to confuse people, but uh, I, I have to emphasize this as well. Um, you have to make your service more difficult for customers, but at the same time, you have to make it easier for them as well. Hmm. Right? How does so that work? Tricky... Yeah, how does that work? Making yeah, it difficult and easy at the same time. Right. So think about Starbucks, right? So there's basically employees are friendly and you, know, you are mm-hmm. giving a lot mm-hmm. of information. Mm-hmm and everything right um but at the same time they use these obscure language mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right italian words and all that so um they are doing both right and i have to also emphasize that uh, sushi sushi chefs although they are intimidating 
they are they are they are making money out of <laughs> yeah. this service. Yeah. So they have yeah. to eventually they have to satisfy customers. Yeah. Right. So it's not like they are making it more di- making it more difficult for the sake of making it more difficult. So mm-hmm. it's it's uh, contradictory things that you have to do in service design. So um, the, the the Starbucks example, yeah. if we continue on that. In, how do how do you know what you should make easy and how do you know what you should make difficult how how does that work yeah i don't sorry i don't i don't know the answer yeah but but what i know is every service in every service design you have to have certain struggle designed into it mm. and you have to negate customers a little bit mm. but at the same time you cannot just uh you know you cannot just negate the customer and leave, right? You have to uh, attract them, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you have to uh, you have to have them survive through the service. Yeah, so yeah. You have to make it easy. Yeah. And, 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 what, you know, what I'm thinking is it's almost uh, it should be experienced as a game. And you said something like he survived. But I can imagine that at the end of the service, you 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 feel like you've overcome a challenge of the, the that you can celebrate a victory that you were able to to get that coffee right or to get that sushi that gives you satisfaction i guess in some sense yeah 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 that you know in most services that kind of uh, struggle is not that dramatic mm, right yeah yeah it, yeah it, it, it can be just italian was on the menu you know you're okay with that yeah a yeah. little bit of a struggle right mm, mm. but uh you know so eventually the service you kind of you kind of overcome and you kind of feel confident yeah, and you yeah. kind of gain yeah. a new self. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, we have a third topic that's also really interested and uh, we should definitely uh, address this one. Uh, so let's move on. Topic number three. It's called radical design perspective. And my question once again, do you have a question starter that goes along with this one? Yeah, so I I go back to this why. The favorite uh, question of a lot of designers. Yeah. <clears throat> so why? Um, so my basic question is this. Uh, why do we put service, the word service, in front of design, the word design, right? So <clears throat> yeah. Um, if we do that, if we call it service design, which I really mm-hmm. like, that's mm-hmm. a concept. Mm-hmm. If we put these two words together, and then we cannot do the design in the same way as before. It has to be a distinct design methodology, design philosophy, mm-hmm. and so on. Mm-hmm. Right? Otherwise, there's no point in putting two words together. Yeah. Right? So, um, so if we, um, so human center design is very important. Uh, I have no problem with that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, although I I want to emphasize that uh, there's the other aspect to uh, service design, which is related to the intersubjective struggle concept. So um, so if we put service in front of design, now the design as a concept is completely different from the traditional concept of design. So and the traditional um, concept is like the product design, industrial design, th- that area, right? Uh, or and I would I would even say human center design. Mm, okay. Uh, okay. So service design is based on human center design. That's half true to me, right? Uh, but if we take it seriously, that service is an intersubjective struggle, mm-hmm. and that you have to negate customers and you have to let customers struggle Mm -hmm. and prove themselves, right? Then uh, you have to have a completely new approach to design, right? And and what's what's different or new about that approach? Yeah, so instead of making it easy and and, uh, instead of empowering customers and letting customers or users take control of the process, Mm -hmm. you have to make it uh, more difficult a little bit of intimidating, and you have to challenge customers, mm, right? Mm. That we, we, we have to have that kind of a process. Um, and again, we have to do both. We have to do the human-centered design as well as the other approach. Right. 
The other approach, I call it human decentered approach or human decentered design. Um, so you, you kind of have to decenter users and uh, users and customers are kind of challenged and prove themselves and become somebody else, somebody new. Mm -hmm. right? That process. That's, that's really interesting because then sort of the the discipline of service design is also will become the discipline of helping people grow as a human being through services by giving them sort of challenges, right? It's, uh, and, uh, maybe yeah. that's a bit exaggerated, but that's at least what I feel yeah, where it's yeah, heading yeah. to. Yeah, when I say that again, uh, not every service is marked in that sense, mm. but uh, you know, it's easy to see that in uh, upscale French restaurants, or upscale mm. restaurants in Japan, but every service has that kind of component mm. built in. And, and uh, I'm also interested, have you also looked at really basic uh, services like in the public sector field, public services, the government? Right. Is this also a part there? Yeah, um, um, yeah, I think so. Uh, think about hospitals, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, 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 I just accept that it's wrong to make it more difficult for mm -hmm. patients. <laughs> mm -hmm. You cannot design hospitals to be more difficult. Exactly. Right? Yeah. 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 So you have to make it easier, right? So that that uh, that's because um, in a hospital setting, right? Um, so you have patients, and patients have some problem and you try to fix the problem, right? Mm -hmm. So who, who the patient is doesn't matter so much if, as long as you are trying to fix the problem that the patient has, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So so the co um, so the co-creation part isn't that uh, big in isn't that mar yeah. right? Yeah, isn't right. Uh, but then so so if we assume that if we kind of say, oh, here's the patient, here's the service hospital service, mm -hmm. and we we kind of separate them. Now the patient is not implicated in the service. Then you have to make it easy, yeah. right? That makes sense. But at the same time, I would say always who the who the patient is also matters in 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 the hospital mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in many in many different ways. Mm -hmm. So maybe patients want to be treated uh, respectfully, or maybe. Um, you know, patients wants wants to show that they are different from other patients. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, they they know they know better than other other patients, so they should be given better service. So, so all those kind of things, right? Mm -hmm. So who they are matters, even in a hospital setting. Yeah. Uh, and if that's the case, then this uh, human decentered design approach or intersubjective struggle aspect of service becomes important, right? So in many hospital settings, you kind of make it obscure for patients, right? You use some medical jargons and you have like uh, electronic medical records that's kind of cryptic for mm -hmm. patients, mm -hmm. and, you know, mm -hmm. right? And you have the doctors, uh, physicians have to show that they are, they, are, they are special, they are different, right? So now it's getting more interesting. Yeah. But, and I, I'm interested if the the uh, amount that of co-creation in a service um, matters for how human decentered it should be. So if there's little, I don't know, I don't know. Well, they... yeah, I I I think that's one way to approach this. So let's say. Um, you go to some kind of a machine mm. to get some drinks. So in Japan, we have all, all kinds of vending machines. So you put some <laughs> yeah. coins and yeah. you press the button and get the drink. Okay, if you think about this as a service and there's no value co-creation, yeah. right? Yeah. Then you want to you wanna make it transparent, easy, and efficient, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, but on the other hand, if you go to an upscale restaurants or hotels, then the other aspect becomes more important. It's interesting. I, I've, I've talked with uh, Joseph Pine from the experience economy here on the show. And what I also feel in this um, episode is that the more a service leans towards an experience, 
the more interesting it becomes to sort of uh, think about the intersubjective struggle and the more a service leans towards a transaction, the, the less mm -hmm. it becomes uh, important to, to, de to, make, yeah, to make it de more human de decentered. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Interesting, if, yeah. right? Because an upscale yeah. restaurant is probably more of an experience than it is actually a, a service. Right. Mm. We're heading towards the end of this episode, but not before I gave you the opportunity to ask, ask the viewers, the listeners of the show a question. Is there anything you'd like to ask us? Yes. My question is this. How can you design a service like Starbucks? Okay, so it's a service. Somebody yeah. designed it, right? But it's not. It's very tricky. The person who designed Starbucks didn't try to satisfy customers in a simple way. Mm -hmm. It's very complicated. So Starbucks started uh, in early seventies. Um, so early seventies, late sixties uh, was the time where the young people who were born after the war, the World mm -hmm, War, mm -hmm. uh, became adults and uh, they kind of struggled to prove themselves because they came to universities to be an elite, but they saw uh, many people like them mm. and they, they couldn't prove themselves uh, in an easy way. So they were trying to, um, they were struggling to prove themselves, right? So Starbucks, was part of the specialty coffee uh, movement. So uh, the, the, the concept was developed by Alfred uh, Pete. Mm -hmm. So Pete's coffee, right? So now you have beans from different terroir and everything, and you have to be culturally sophisticated. So cultural sophistication is a way to show that you are different. Mm. So that's, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. how you show your identity, right? So. Uh, and then Starbucks kind of repeated the model in Seattle, right? And they became successful. So already we are seeing that they are not just satisfying uh, the needs or requirements or appetite of the, the customers, right? They, the customers wanted to become uh, some other people. So, uh, and there's another twist to this story. Hmm. So. Howard Schultz uh, came to Starbucks and he completely transformed uh, Starbucks. And there are so many specialty coffee shops uh, around that time, but Starbucks uh, was the only one that became globally successful, right? So uh, the trick was this. So Schultz um, kind of thought that um, not most customers are not seeking the authentic uh, cultural sophistication type experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Most customers wanted the Italian words. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Most, uh, <laughs> so now it's getting more interesting. Now he re completely re re redesigned the specialty coffee uh, service and they kind of preserved, he kind of pre preserved the Italian authentic atmosphere but making it more accessible to right. many customers. Right. He commoditized it, basically. Right. So he is a genius because he <laughs> kind of played this subtle game of culture, right? So now customers can just pay $4 and then, you know, uh, in an easy way, in an accessible way, experience this part of culture, hmm. right? So, but uh, my point is this. So uh, to design that kind of service, um, you... I guess human-centered design, although it's very important. Um, if I were a designer, I would do human-centered design, but you need something different as well. So, and, the, the, and my answer, to, yeah, yeah. So, the, the, my answer to that is a human-decentered design. Yeah, and and uh, if I understand your story correctly, um, Starbucks played a role in helping people to express their identity or to make their identity tangible by allowing them to be part of the sophisticated coffee movement. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's still uh, challenging for customers. Some kind of negation was going on because now you are using the words, Italians, words that uh, most customers don't know and mm. be awkward. Mm. Right? Um, but 
still, he's a genius because he, at the same time, he made it more accessible. For mm. And people. if you, if we would have to summarize this question, how would what would the question be to us? Yeah. So uh, service design has to be broader. It's already broad, but it's broader. So um, I would ask this question, right? What kind of uh, identity project people have, right? Uh, so service designers have to think about it. So right now in this particular situation, most people are having some kind of anxiety in terms of how they can prove themselves, right? That always the starting point. Uh, but even before that, there's some kind of social change, mm, right? Mm. In the case of Starbucks, that's the generational difference, right? Uh, the young people in the late 60s, the early 70s had that kind of particular problems. So social change, people, people's identity projects, and then service design. Mm, mm. So we have to think about the whole thing as service designers. We have to, so how do we incorporate thinking about social change and how people, yeah, maybe social change and incorporate that into our service offering as well? Yeah. That's the question, right? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Super interesting. Taka, I'm, I'm sort of going to thank you because you've, uh, I think you've inspired a lot of people in this episode. And I think uh, a lot of people will have questions if they want to reach out to you. What's the best way to get in touch next to commenting on this episode? Um, I have my website mm -hmm. and I have uh, all the details about okay. myself. Um, I'll make sure to link, so uh, to put links in the uh, show notes. So if people want to discuss this topic further with you or with us, uh, they can they can get in touch. Thanks again. Thanks for your time. It was really inspiring, uh, Yutaka. I hope I didn't make it more confusing. <laughs> I, I hope you did because yeah. that's that's the goal of the show. We, we want the struggle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. All right. Thanks. So what do you think? Do you know of services that are actually a struggle for customers, leave a comment down below and share your examples. And if you enjoyed this episode and know someone who might benefit from what we've just discussed, make sure to grab the link and share that with them. If this is your first time here, I'd love to have you to subscribe so that we can keep bringing you more videos like this. Thanks for watching and I look forward to see you in the next video.